Hi, I'm Bob Doyle, webcasting from my ITV studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and just hooking up my microphone. Hope I've got it on properly. I need to go set up my audio screen here so I see that you should be hearing me correctly. Uh, let me get in a slightly closer view to my ITV studio. You see my little screen on the wall behind us where I will usually start with the title of today's lecture. Uh, you see my uh, prompter script, which I'm not using today. I've been developing a new one, which I'll begin with perhaps next year. This lecture is the last lecture of 2017 because uh, over the weekend I won't be lecturing and I look forward to talking to you on uh, Monday. So let's come around to this view, turn off my little email address. And here we are, and I've got up on the screen not my lecture, so I need to switch that screen to showing you this. Uh, it's Albert Einstein Day on Fridays, and I'm going to use this day to kind of get back into the uh, writing of my book, uh, which I hope will bring out early next year, called My God, He Plays Dice, How Albert Einstein Invented most of quantum mechanics. It's a, a long road to explaining uh, Einstein, and I'm doing it here, and I'll give you a quick look at my setup in this new ITV studio. I'm sort of happy to have completed this work on the studio this year. I've had um, several months of work to put this concept all together so that I have a screen which I'm using here to show my blog, the Information Philosopher blog, where every weekday I put up the topic of my presentation and allow you to have a little introductory uh, material to go with it on that blog. Over here I have another screen, which in this case has got an important part of the Albert Einstein web page. Uh, up in this big screen at the middle, I have another section of my Albert Einstein web page. Here my keyboard lets me work that big screen, and it's on the big screen that I can select text so you can read it clearly, and uh, all of these allow me to increase the size of the text so that it's very visible to you, and uh, my goal is to always be showing you things that you can hear from me and that you can also read from me. I come, can come around here and take a look at this screen, which has, looks down on us, and I see I've got that set to a close-up of all of my, my screens. Uh, my audio levels are showing over here and uh, so forth. I'll just pull out a little bit so you can see the rest of my lab where I have multiple monitors of what's coming in and go, what's going out over the Internet. Okay, well, let's come back to this screen and tell you why I want to uh, end up 2017 uh, helping myself to get back on topic to write this book about Einstein. And one of the things that's in that book that I hope is apt to end the year, we'll start on a positive note uh, next uh, Monday, this is a sort of negative note for Albert Einstein because I'm going to try to convince you, and I hope my book will convince readers someday, that Einstein spent his entire life trying to find what he called a unified field theory. And the idea was simple. Newton had discovered the gravitational field. And what is a gravitational field? It's the idea that at every point in space and time, one can calculate from a simple function, the value of that gravitational field at every point. And if one calculates the rate of change of that gravitational field with position, for example, as you get away from the, away from the sun, uh, the gravitational field gets weaker and weaker. As you're getting close, it gets stronger and stronger. It's this famous 
gravitational equation that the force is equal to the gravitational constant g times the mass of the sun times the mass of the earth, say, divided by the square of the distance to the sun. It's called an inverse square law. If you had some physics, you may have been exposed to this notion that there is a very simple equation which tells us the gravitational field and the gradient of that field is what produces the force on the Earth, keeping it going around the Sun in orbit. And uh, the other field, which for Einstein was extremely important, was discovered by James Clerk Maxwell. It's called the electromagnetic field. A, another expression that's written in terms of uh, the position in space and time and somehow all space and all time give you a value of the of electric uh, field vector and the magnetic field vector. And these are vector equations and uh, rather more complicated. But Einstein's goal very simply was to unify those two fields and find an expression that it could explain both gravity and electricity or magnetism, electromagnetic uh, theory. Now, in the intervening years, there have become other forces and other force fields. For example, inside the nucleus, there is the nuclear force that holds the particles together, the, the quarks and so forth of the most elementary particles. Einstein never really got involved with that, but today, to unify a field theory, you'd like to describe that as well. <clears throat> and quantum field theory does get to that, but we, we're going to live in Einstein's time because we're trying to understand his own thinking. And there's another field called the electroweak field, which is involved when a radioactive atom decays and it gives off a, perhaps an electron or a neutrino or other uh, new particles that have been discovered uh, since Einstein's time, uh, since early quantum mechanics in any case. But coming back to the overall notion of a field, I must uh, try, try to emphasize that Einstein became a concerned that a field theory was not adequate to describe what's going on in quantum physics, okay? And here is, here is what I'm describing our conclusions. This is what we're going to show today, that he's going to conclude that fields, the thing he wanted to find in a field theory, may only be averages over large numbers of particles. That is to say, this is a very deep, almost metaphysical depth problem or suggestion that maybe the entire contents of the universe may be describable by fields, and they work very well, but that those fields are not real. What's real is individual particles flying around everywhere such that when there are large numbers of them, they appear to provide a field, a theoretical field, and that's an important distinction. Field theories are theories about values of a variable throughout space that's being determined by what? By the distribution of material, okay? If we put a lot of electrical uh, charge uh, on the surface of a sphere, we can calculate the f effect of that charge at all positions away from it. Even a single electron creates a field out in uh, different distances and positions away from that electron. We can calculate that, but is there anything there besides the theory? So that a field is a theory that says, if there was a particle at this position, then this particle, we call it a test particle, would feel a force because of the field of the other particle or particles or many particles or the walls. If there are walls here, that will produce uh, certain consequences inside the walls. They may be electrical conducting walls. They could be just physical material walls. We'll be looking at those in the future. The whole idea I'm trying to get to you is that a field is a theory, whereas uh, locating, locating a particle and making a measurement on a test particle or with a test particle is an experiment. Okay, so particles are substantial. Particles are the sort of thing that we think when we think the world is made up of stuff. The stuff is 
Uh, weighable, heavy, it has mass. Electrons have mass. Most particles have mass. Light particles, unfortunately, the light quanta that Einstein discovered uh, were individual particles in 1905, uh, have a kind of mass, but it isn't the ordinary kind of mass. It's a kind of mass equivalent of their energy uh, because uh, light quanta, now called photons, do not actually, um, cannot be captured and then seem to be a particle. They can be captured by an atom or matter and they heat up, they add energy to the matter because they do carry energy. Light is energy flying through space at the speed of light. Nothing that can go at the speed of light though has any mass. That's a subtlety and uh, apologize for the complexity of this subject we're dealing with. Uh, someday I hope to get it explainable down to a level that many more people will be very comfortable with uh, our understanding of quantum mechanics. And that's despite Richard Feynman, whose lecture we gave a few weeks ago, who pronounced, no one understands quantum mechanics. And that's a very sad thing because uh, many, many brilliant people have had lots of trouble with understanding quantum mechanics because it has non-intuitive aspects. And our goal then will be to see if we can go back to a more commonsensical view of most of quantum mechanics. But when we get right down into the heart of it, right, get in, into the uh, essential difference between classical physics and quantum physics, you're going to have to, at that point, embrace what a Feynman called the one mystery in quantum mechanics. And it's what Einstein saw as the statistical nature of quantum mechanics, that it deals only with probabilities. Uh, and we're going to get there. Uh, I'm going to try to show you from uh, the end of my large Einstein page. Uh, my Einstein book is really coming from a large number of pages that are on the website at Albert Einstein. You just go to his page. It's enormously long, and it's on its way to becoming a book and a print book. Uh, but I'm going to go towards the end of uh, that page, and let's look at these uh, ideas first uh, in the blog post that I put up today on Information Philosopher blog. I say Einstein in his later years, let's bring it up to you on the full screen, <coughs> he became pessimistic about the possibilities for deterministic and continuous field theories. Let me back up on just that thought. A continuous field theory has values at every single point. But there's some deep metaphysical question which I deal with in the book, Metaphysics. Uh, I think I have a copy of my Metaphysics book here somewhere. And I want to remind you that this book is av available for free download from my website at metaphysicist.com or my informationphilosopher.com website. What we're talking about here is if a field is continuous, it means it has values at all, time, all points in time, all points in space, at all times. And that the value has, in some sense, needs, in some sense, an infinite amount of information to describe these values at an infinite number of points. Because a continuum is said to have any two points on a line. Between those two points on the line, there are an infinite number of points. Einstein worried about this. He wasn't uh, like some others who worried about infinities, uh, like Cantor and other great mathematicians who wondered whether space could be containing an infinite number of points. In what sense does it contain an infinite number? Well, mathematically, we have a, a way of describing, uh, we have a way of counting those points. For example, if we count only the integers, well, there's a certain number, but it turns out the integers go on forever. So we have an infinite but countable number of inter real integers. Well, between the real integers, there are fractions, and there are other so-called irrational numbers. And so the number of numbers explodes, and on its way to infinity, even between any two finite points in space and time. So these are things that were in the background of Einstein's mind, well trained in all of this, certainly understand what he was doing. But for him, a continuous field theory was the ideal. Imagine that you grow up admiring Newton, 
and his great continuous field theory with values at all places in space and time. And then you, a young Albert Einstein, actually show that there's something better, a theory that works better and explains more about the universe than Newton. And you come up with relativity for space and time, special relativity, and then 10 years later, general relativity, which shows that space and time are nothing or in only an approximate way what Newton saw. And there's more going on, and Einstein was the one to discover them. So surely he hoped he would go on and show that this continuous field theory would apply uh, and uh, to everything, including the quantum mechanical microscopic domain of the atoms and molecules and so forth, especially the ones in our body, which you know I'm very interested in. So uh, coming back, what, what he said was he was doubtful about the deterministic and continuous field theories by comparison with indeterministic and statistical and note discontinuous particle theories like those of, part of quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, we have specific particles and then nothing between them and the next particle, depending on how far away it is. For example, in the universe today, on average, there is one hydrogen atom, okay, a proton and electron, the simplest of all the atoms, per cubic meter. So just imagine the meter here, that's my meter length, that much height and then that much depth. And in one cubic meter, we only have one hydrogen atom. The universe is amazingly sparsely populated with atomic objects. So Einstein anyway, coming back, although initially he was a strong critic of quantum theory and its implications for indeterminism and a statistical nature of reality, from the 1930s on, I want to show and prove that he never said that quantum mechanics is, quote, incorrect as far as it goes, only that something else would need to be added to quantum physics in the future to make it what he called complete. Now, as early as 1930, Einstein marveled at the logical strength of the theory and especially its form, his formulation by uh, Paul Dirac. He, and he said, quote, to whom, in my opinion, we owe the most perfect exposition logically of this theory. And, but then I get down onto the negative aspect of our lecture today. To his friend Leopold Infeld, wrote an important book with uh, Infeld, I tend more and more to the opinion that one cannot come further with a continuum theory. That's amazing. That's his life's work there. And here he is confiding to one of his closest friends. I'm afraid the thing I'm hoping for may not be possible. And the reason it's not possible, because of quantum physics and quantum mechanics, things like the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg and others, but all those parts that bothered Einstein, I will show were things that were he originally discovered were true of the universe. So in his 1949 autobiography, uh, which Einstein called his obituary, uh, there are a famous set of volumes uh, edited by Paul Schilp on the life of great scientists and philosophers. And the volume on Einstein uh, included, everyone included, invited the living uh, philosopher and scientist to write a, a brief autobiography. Einstein wrote one and he repeated concerns uh, that he developed first in 1935 in the famous Einstein Podolsky Rosen paradox paper. Um, he says here, I must take a stand with reference to the most successful physical theory of our period, namely the statistical quantum theory which about 25 years ago took on a consistent logical form. And he mentions Erwin Schrodinger, Werner Heisenberg, Paul Dirac, and Max Born. This is the only theory at present which permits a unitary grasp of experiences concerning the quantum character of micromechanical events. This theory on the one hand and the theory of relativity on the other are both considered correct in a certain sense although their combination has resisted all efforts up to now. <clears throat> now, once again, Einstein had created the relativity theory, special relativity, that things cannot go faster than the speed of light. And yet there were people who were describing what was going on in quantum mechanics in some particular experiments. 
as something uh, starting here and going here, uh, even if here is very far away, more or less instantaneously. And that was something he had seen first, I will convince you, I hope in my longer book treatment. He saw it first in 1905, and 30 years later in 1935, he's now saying it looks to him that relativity, which is correct, and this statistical theory of quantum mechanics was correct. They seem not to work together very well. And he says, this is probably the reason why among contemporary theoretical physicists there exist entirely different opinions concerning the question as to how the theoretical foundations of the physics of the future will appear. And then he asked this profound and very deep question. Will it be a field theory or will it be, in essence, a statistical theory? And that's the key question. I'm going to hope to convince you that he decided it has to be not his continuous field theory. And then he says, physics is an attempt conceptually to grasp reality as it is thought independently of its being observed. Now, the quantum physicist had come up with this positivistic, philosophically positive theory that you must be able to observe something in order to in order for it to have a reality. It would be real if you could observe it, which is fundamentally to measure it, to get a quantity associated with it, say that it's at a particular place in a particular time. But quantum mechanics seems to be saying, we have no idea where the particle is until we measure it. Well, that seems fairly anthropomorphic. You mean the world even doesn't know where it is until some physicist measures it? Uh, John Bell famously said, does that person measuring have to have a PhD in order for the world to do what it does only in a physics experiment? Do we, can we say there is a reality? Uh, is that reality a consequence uh, of the fact that we have an observer who's conscious, a conscious observer, and that it has to involve something to do with the mind? There's been a lot of bizarre philosophizing about the meaning and interpretation of quantum mechanics all of which I hope to treat, and I already do on my web pages, but in the context of Albert Einstein's work. So he says, in this sense, one speaks of, quote, physical reality. In pre-quantum physics, there was no doubt as to how this was to be understood. In Newton's theory, reality was determined by a material point in space and time. In Maxwell's theory, by the field in space and time, in quantum mechanics, it is not so easily seen. And there's the problem. Einstein is now uh, probably going to live only for about six more years, and he never will make progress on this. Uh, and since I'm trying uh, in our theme today to show that he perhaps is resigned to the fact that it's the particles, the ma material, like in Newton's theory of gravity between material particles, that probably is going to be the best theory of what all fields are really just averages over particles. So again, two years before his death, or one really, Einstein wrote his friend Michael Besso in, to express his lost hopes for a continuous field theory like that of electromagnetism or gravitation. He says, I consider it quite possible that physics cannot be based on, a, on the field concept on continuous structures. And in that case, think how devastating this must be to, the, in some way, the smartest physicist of all time. In that case, nothing remains of my entire castle in the air, gravitation theory included, and of all the rest of, of uh, modern physics. That's been the point, that is the point of my talk today. Uh, to see this old man whose colleagues were all talking to him as if he really had lost touch with modern physics, that he didn't really understand modern physics. And in 1935, he particularly wrote a paper uh, that uh, caused everyone a great deal of puzzlement in those days. That was the Einstein Podolsky Rosen, in which he said, It seems as if things are going faster than light, and it seems as if no matter how far away a particle is, it seems to know something about the other particle. We're going to spend some time for the rest of the lecture kind of looking into that and see what it is Einstein was groping for. But here I think I have one final quote. 
uh, in a book called The Meaning of Relativity, published posthumously, uh, has an appendix on Einstein's field theory of gravitation. In the final paragraphs of this work, his last work, uh, Einstein wrote, Is it conceivable that a field theory permits one to understand the atomistic and quantum structure of reality? Almost everybody will answer this question with no. One can give good reasons why reality cannot at all be represented by a continuous field. From the quantum phenomena, it appears to follow with certainty that a finite system of finite energy can be completely described by a finite set of numbers. Let's come back to that for a moment. Einstein is actually saying maybe uh, he's not convinced that math will not allow continuous infinite number of numbers. But he's saying maybe what quantum physics is telling us is that the entire theory of, of physics, which would be adequate to describe the complete world, might be manageable with a finite number of numbers to describe, uh, he says, the energy. Uh, but in turn, we may draw implications about the places things can be found. These it's almost, it has the feeling of saying, maybe space itself is only limited to certain quantum size objects or volumes in which something can be. We won't be able to go there, but some, some those uh, interpreting and philosophizing about uh, space and time do talk in those terms. Let's go back to his final remark. This does not seem to be in accordance with a continuum theory and must lead to an attempt to find a purely algebraic theory for the description of reality. But nobody knows how to obtain the basis of such a theory. Okay, well, that's uh, what I prepared for you on my blog uh, as the kind of introduction to this subject that maybe Einstein had to give up for the unified field theory Others kept trying. Erwin Schrodinger had worked on a unified field theory, which Einstein said was nonsense, and others have written on it. And there are today modern theories of all kinds, quantum gravity and so many other things going on, many of which go back and touch on this. Quantum field theory is a field theory, but it does explain finite objects also. Um, but I won't be able to go there. I want to stay with Einstein. Uh, and let's see, I've gone through this section, and what I'd like to do is uh, move on to this page. And this uh, page is uh, around the time that Einstein accepted quantum mechanics, as you just saw. And uh, let's see if I can take that up to my, my other screen so it's behind me when I come back here. Yes, now that's too small to read, people are telling me, and it's very hard to expand it very much. Uh, so I think I'll bring it up on my other screen, which is over here, show you what I'm doing. Uh, let's see, I'd like to bring that same section up from my Einstein page. So here's a look at Einstein, the work on Einstein. I think I'll come back to doing you that diagram with you shortly. Um, and some of these others. And so here we are. Einstein accepts quantum mechanics, but hopes for a continuum theory. Let me see if I can expand this just a bit. And I say in 1933, Einstein described one way to reconcile non-locality with a four-dimensional space-time theory. And, it, and what I'm trying to show here is that this is not He's a, he's a critic of quantum mechanics at this time, but he isn't really just saying, never did say, quantum mechanics is incorrect. He always knew that it was explaining things that he himself had discovered. This is very important to me that I know and I'm going to be able to show you with the much earlier parts of this page or in the earlier sections of the book on Einstein that he saw non-locality and this instantaneous action at a distance, which for him, you know, he called it spooky action at a distance, seemed to violate his principle of relativity. Uh, and yet he knew that quantum mechanics is the very best theory we have up until this time. 
So let's, let's listen to what he says here. The modern quantum theory, he says, let's uh, bring that up for you here. The modern quantum theory associated with the names of de Broglie, who had a, a wave theory, Schrodinger, who developed wave mechanics, and Dirac, Paul Dirac, who combined uh, matrix or particle mechanics with wave mechanics. Um, these are all enormously important players. So associated with those names, the modern quantum theory, of course, operates with continuous functions. So what do we have here? Let me back off for a moment. There are continuous functions in quantum mechanics, and they constitute a theory. And that theory is, describes the wave of wave mechanics. The wave of wave mechanics is not a particle, and its connection with the particle is misrepresented in almost all of the modern Scientific American and other articles of popular representations of quantum mechanics, where people think, well, there are times when the wave is a particle and the time when the particle is a wave. The relationship between wave and particle was clearly understood by Albert Einstein, and we're going to have to try to home in on it and uh, uh, make some progress with the work that Dirac did especially. Dirac clearly understood this, uh, that the wave was a continuous function. Okay, and uh, let's come back here and follow with this. Um, so, if the theory has overcome this difficulty by means of a daring interpretation, first given in a clear form by Max Born, the space functions, those are we call the wave functions today, first appear in the equations, make no claim to be a mathematical model of atomic objects. Now, it turns out Schrodinger hoped for that very thing, that these space functions or wave functions could be a way of describing the particles, okay? That the wave functions could be shaped and turned into things so that Schrodinger could convince others that his idea of waves and the wave equation were all need, that was needed to understand quantum physics. You just need to imagine that there's some kind of a wave packet which has values in a certain range area and it travels around looking like a particle to the experimenters. Well, that turned out not to be the case. And so these functions are only supposed to determine in a mathematical way the probabilities of encountering the objects in a particular place or in a particular state of motion if we make a measurement. This conception is logically unexceptionable and has led to important successes. So. Here we have Einstein saying, this theory works wonderfully, and it remains to this day as the best theory of physics that we have in the world. Quantum physics is the foundation of everything else, and all the classical physics that had been developed beforehand are the limit of quantum physics when you have a large number of particles around. Uh, it goes over continuously from a quantum theory to a classical theory, provided you have so many particles, you're averaging over large numbers of them, and then they smooth out, sort of speak, they average out, and the large numbers of particles act like the waves of water waves, because there are so many water molecules and so forth. But now Einstein is a little concerned, and he says, on the other hand, it seems to me certain that we have to give up the notion of an absolute localization of the particles in the theoretical model. And he's quite correct about that. We only know where they are localized within the kind of fuzziness of the uncertainty principle, which has to do with Einstein's earlier discoveries about randomness at this low level. This seems to me to be the correct theoretical interpretation of Heisenberg's indeterminacy relation, famous uncertainty principle. And yet, he says, a theory may perfectly well exist which is in a genuine sense an atomistic one, and not merely on the basis of a particular interpretation, in which there is no localizing of the particles in a mathematical model. For example, in order to include the atomistic character of electricity, maybe the field equations just need to involve that a certain three-dimensional volume of space on whose boundary the electrical density vanishes contains the total electrical charge, 
So we would get back a continuum theory, and the atomistic character could be satisfactorily expressed by integral propositions without locus localizing the particles which constitute the atomic system, the atomistic system. Only if this sort of representation could be obtained could I regard the quantum problem within the framework of a continuum theory as solved. Okay, but here, see what we're trying to build up here. He, this is a, a person, this is writing in 1934, but this is someone who already at that time was beginning to doubt the possibility of a continuum theory. And 20 years after this, in the 50s, early 50s, he's basically giving up. He doesn't see uh, any possibility. Okay, so at this point, uh, in my chronological uh, presentation of, of the Einstein webpage that we're looking at here, we are at the point of 1935. We were just listening to Einstein in 1933, and he's saying, having a lot of trouble having a continuous theory uh, to explain such uh, things as these atomistic things. So then in 1935, Einstein had two colleagues. He had come to America. He was now at the Institute um, in, at uh, Princeton, the Institute for Advanced Study, made a special arrangement to give him a lifetime appointment and a significant uh, salary and a room and a place to work for the rest of his life, which he did. Now, when he was there in the early years, and really for some time, he never got really uh, uh, facile with the English language. And this paper was written in English. And we now learn that Boris Podolsky, a Russian, uh, and Nathan Rosen uh, were the, Podolsky, I believe mostly, was, was the writer of this paper based on what Einstein had been saying and thinking. And uh, Einstein had endorsed the publication, but there's a bit of a scandal that he did not actually critically read and approve the final paper. It just went off and it got published. And uh, Einstein uh, wrote some uh, critical notes saying they really didn't get the problem that he was worried about. So this is fascinating, and I hope to be able to work my way through that and see what Podolsky and Rosen had written and what it is Einstein was worried about at the time. Uh, I'm going to try to argue that he was worried about this fact that when a light wave goes out in all directions and then at one single point a particle of light appears since his first work in 1905, how did all of that light energy, imagine the light energy is going out and out and out and out and out and, out and then boom, suddenly all that energy reappears at this one point. That was the essence, it is the essence of non-locality that somehow things elsewhere are affecting what's going on here. And did that come across in the einstein Podolsky rosen paper? Well, you can find it in there, but you have to look for it. Uh, and what got added at this time was that everything Einstein had written about up to this time talked about one particle and then the fact that the wave function of quantum mechanics that describes it has values at all parts of space that it's traveled to, but when we measure it, we always find it in one particular place, not distributed out in all of those places where the theoretical wave function, the continuous function, the theory predicts places for the particle to be, but the experiment always, when it's found, finds it in one place. That's what Einstein uh, discovered it came to be called non-locality. But in 1935, Einstein, and with his helpers Podolsky and Rosen, described the situation where instead of one particle and a lot of wave function of where it could be, he imagined two particles. And in these two particles, he imagined that they would leave from the center uh, in, an, in a kind of um, an explosion or something that drove the two particles in opposite directions. They would travel out to uh, distant places. And Einstein had already written a little bit about this curious fact that he said that, imagine you just had two bullets that were fired opposite, equal opposite directions, really just a little uh, seriously like bullets. And they go equal opposite directions, they're the same mass, so they travel out a certain direction. Say one is off to our uh, 
over here, the other one is over here, and they are now uh, e equally far from the center. If they left with exactly the same velocity and or momentum, right? That's what Einstein is setting up. He now says, suppose we look for one of them and we find it here. He then says, if we think about the center, and I'm not quite centered in this picture, so let me do something here. Let me take myself back to this picture for a moment, see if I can get in the middle. So let's say we explode from this spot and here, and they travel apart, and they travel apart at equal opposite speeds. I haven't done a very good job here. Looking in a TV monitor, it's hard to tell left from right. It's not like a mirror, actually. So. Here we have the two of them equally opposite from the center. And when we measure this one, we automatically know where the other one is, OK? So what Einstein is telling us, how can we know about the other particle? Now the answer, why do we have knowledge about the other particle? If it has not been hit by anything else, if it didn't run into a wall before it got to the other place, we can conclude in information terms, and here I am, the information philosopher, trying to build something into this. We can know where the other one is because there are conservation laws that tell us that whatever the momentum it has will be conserved, and unless someone disturbs it, it will be where we can know it to be. And he, that is a kind of knowledge at a distance, I like to call it. I like to think if Einstein had thought some more about this, he might have not called it action at a distance, but knowledge at a distance, uh, for the simple reason that the premise is that these two things leave the center and go off in opposite directions. And therefore, when we measure one, we know exactly where the other one is. But let's now crank forward to doing this down at the scale of, of atoms or photons or electrons, uh, because there it he, Einstein proposed that he would have a spooky action at a distance that when we measure one particle, we get some information about the other particle, um, namely that it, it's at another distance, the same distance from the center. But beyond that, um, it has the possibility of, of uh, uh, having a variable, which is called the electron spin, which is the enhanced version of this um, EPR experiment that is performed today in, in the physics world, OK? Now, let me take this page we've got here and see where I'm going. I'd like to take, me, take us down to this picture that Einstein just had described. Um, because if we had in the center two particles, E1 and E2, and they left the center with exactly opposite uh, momenta, measuring one of them will tell you something about the other one, OK, at a great distance. And apparently, information about the other one has traveled faster than light speed. Well, has anything really transferred? Has ever anything substantial traveled faster than light speed? I think you'll agree, no. We don't require some something physical, something material, something energetic to travel from electron two to electron one in order for us to know when we measure one where two is at the moment. Let me just try to reproduce this one. I know this lecture is all rather obscure, perhaps. And I know uh, this is taught uh, as a, a problems that are entangled with one another in a mysterious way. And entanglement is regarded as a very, very mysterious aspect of quantum mechanics that some describe as the second quantum revolution beyond the original quantum mechanics that Feynman already told us we can't understand. We've got this new mystery about how these two particles are so far apart, and yet measuring one immediately tells us something about the other. Okay, So with this simple example, where all we've done is fire two particles, and they leave the center. And they separate. Whoops, I am something bad is happening to my camera. Oh, I see what it is. <laughs> my apologies. There we go. I think probably I can just do uh, this and it should reset itself. My, my studio has 
a crammed space in which I'm sitting and I just put on, pushed on the control. Uh, I have a wonderful control system here. Let me show you how this works since we're interrupting. I basically can control several cameras in my studio. Uh, and this one is my principal camera. So I have uh, an automatic button that returns it to the right place. And I interrupted that. Uh, I've worked hard on this studio. It's been several months building it and designing and building it. It's now working pretty well for me. OK, back to this simple view of the separation of two particles. They're just plain particles. They could be billiard balls uh, leaving the center of a table. And if you made them separate with equal velocities, when you measure this one, you can calculate where the other one is. You know where it is, assuming it wasn't interrupted. OK, let's go down then to um, visual, I call it visualizing entanglement, no, non-locality, and the idea that these are non-separable, that they retain a connection with one another. And there's a lot here. But here's an example of, uh, let's see if this is the one I have that I want you to see. Right. This is an animation. Here the particles separate from one another, and A and B, they suddenly show up. When E1 is measured with spin up, spin up, one half spin up, right? The spin is either up or down. Something happens so that instantaneously over here at B, uh, watch what happens, boom. This one winds up with its spin down. This is the way the problem is usually presented. Uh, let me just shrink it a little bit so it sits, fits on the screen just a little bit better. And here we are preparing them in a spin state with total spin zero up and down. They separate, they're measured, one is up, the other one is down. What's so puzzling about this? The puzzlement seems to come from the idea, uh, the very powerful, deep idea, that we can't know anything about the particle until we measure it. And until we measure it, it could be in a linear combination of up and down. It could be up or it could be down. That's the way we talk about this entanglement problem. So. I made this animation uh, several years ago is when I was developing the Einstein part of my website. And in recent years, I've been trying to do another animation. So let me show you this one and let me shrink it down a little bit uh, so it all fits on the screen. And I need to get access to my, uh, I don't know why I can't move this over a little bit. Uh, I guess we'll have to do with this. This one I've turned into a, an animation that I can move with a uh, slider, right? So let me just play it. And once again, let's imagine that we're talking about the original Einstein or the new version in which we have the two electrons. At the beginning, when they, when they appear, right here in the beginning, one, one is up and one is down. Now, typically, this is described as the two of them oscillating between states that they could be in, and we don't know which, so they must be in both, like Schrodinger's cat being dead and alive at the same time, which is a serious common sense error that we will, I hope, explain in the future. So let's uh, animate this and have it look as if each particle is sometimes up and sometimes down, okay? And they're oscillating, and boom, when they get to the end, Electron one is spin up, and electron two is spin down. We often describe this as Alice over here making her measurement, and Bob over here making his measurement. And no matter how many times they measure this thing, let me see if I can start it again. There we go. It always agrees that when one is up, two is down, and vice versa. This animation just lets me show those two things. And let me again say, this comes from the fact that while they're traveling, we can't know their path, and we cannot know anything about them. And so at the end of the event, and that event could take a long time, if we make this thing travel many, many miles, these experiments have been done over hundreds of miles, um, one assumes, everyone assumes when they describe entanglement that it is totally mysterious how it is that the one out here can completely agree with the 
other particle if the two have opposite momenta or in the earlier position if all we had is they know they are at some position and we can calculate what it is as Einstein wrote it up. Now I'm going to give you one more diagram and I'm going to say as I write here here's an animation that illustrates the unprovable assumption that the two electrons are randomly produced in a spin up and a spin down state but which is fine actually but that they remain in those states no matter how far they separate provided neither interacts until the measurement now um, let me just animate it for you and then we'll talk about what why I think this is something that Einstein considered and it looks like this they're created and then they separate. Let me hit the little play button here. And all the while, the states that they are in are remain, they remain in until they're measured. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying something pretty radical here. Let me see if I can start it again. If they start out with one up and two down, then they're measured with one up and two down. Now that may seem too commonsensical to be believed and there must be something wrong with what I'm describing because quantum physicists everywhere say there's a mystery here and they cannot understand why when one particle is traveled over here and it's up the other one should be exactly down every single time no matter how many times you make a measurement you never find the other one uh, the two of them up at the same time so let's take a deep breath and see what Einstein who is incredibly good at understanding what he called a principles physics with principles as opposed to physics that are based on construction of theories from experiments the principle that Einstein in my view of this model has in mind is the conservation of spin in this case or conservation of momentum in the earlier case conservation of energy and other things if nothing intervenes in this experiment one can say that to be sure we do not know what the values uh, the exact value of the path that's being taken but we could draw some conclusions that they probably went from the center to the to the two experimenters but officially quantum mechanics says you do not know anything about the path and I agree with that because uh, when we did the two slit experiment particles seem to go in and land at all different places although they then landed with the probability that the wave function told us they should land so that we saw the, the existence of the wave function with its interference when we saw the statistics of large numbers of particles we do not know when we say we do not know the exact path that's taken more importantly we say we have no equations that can tell us the exact path but let's back up a moment with Einstein and say but we do know or we can think possibly it's reasonable to think that the particle never did jump in one from one place to another in the meantime when we didn't know how to measure it or didn't measure it it didn't for example split into two or three pieces and then reassemble itself that would really have been been the worry that Einstein had that if this one particle a light particle Come, becomes a wave and travels parts of itself in lots of different places then in order to get back together it has to make a last moment spectacular faster than light jump to do something well same here if the particles are separating and they actually let's now imagine uh, maybe I can try to imagine that, but that when they leave the center let me play it again we think maybe it went up here and over here and then finally only got back to here is that what the people who are criticizing in this, in this simple idea that they have a path and we just don't know the path and they want to insist that they could be anywhere? The, what could be anywhere in the meantime is just that probability of being there. The wave function is a theory about the probability of finding particles at different places. But Einstein in this sort of... Uh, or me channeling Einstein and concentrating on the fact of conservation uh, could say and he does ask I think I have the question I'm not sure I can bring it up for you here on our screen um, he does ask does the particle have a path 
even though we don't know the path. And so this brings us into the, the great metaphysical question about the difference between human ignorance and the lack of such information in the universe, right? Uh, is it that we just don't know where the particle is, that our theory can't tell us where it is, but it actually is somewhere? And that uh, conf conflicts with the idea that the probability says it might be anywhere. And that says that the probability wave function seems to be giving a kind of control, an influence of where particles go, but only over large numbers of particles. When we have one particle at a time, there's no way, no theory, no quantum, quantum theory does not tell us where it's going to land. And of course, it doesn't tell us where it, how it travels in order to get where it lands. We don't know that. We cannot know that within the mathematical uh, predictions of the theory. But if we will study lots and lots of particles, we discover where they land and predict where they land, and our predictions are phenomenally accurate, and they show that there appear to have been controlling influences that make the particles land in such a way as to show an interference pattern on the back screen. Now, Einstein must, if he's thought about this, and Feynman has, of course, thought about it, it seems a total mystery how a wave function, we can calculate it, can influence the particles one at a time so that when we do thousands and thousands of experiments, they give us back this perfect wave shape in the form of interference. In other words, one particle at a time seems to know about what all the other particles did so that they can all get themselves together and line them up, not like so many soldiers in a row, but in, in numbers such that the ups and down parts of the wave pattern are visible on the back wall of our two-slit experiment. Well, I am going to hope to get to the point of, of Einstein, um, Einstein's thinking, telling us that perhaps the individual particles even though quantum mechanics can't tell us where they are, are in fact somewhere. Uh, the con the, the, the uh, criticism of that way of talking is to say, if you know it is somewhere, then it can't interfere with itself. And it is true that if the particle is measured somewhere, there's no way it can now, the wave function has changed from what it was before. It's now describing a particle at a particular place. It doesn't have the two slit effect anymore where the wave function had values because of the boundary conditions in the two slit experiment. We've been there before and I'll be there again, but I want to just wind up today with a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, this is my last lecture of uh, 2017. Over the weekend when I'm back, it'll be the new year, so I'll wish you a happy new year. And I would like to come back to this subject of Einstein and give it a lot more thought uh, so I can make progress with my book. Uh, so on Monday, I think I've already set up um, a, a topic for us. Uh, our Monday is our problems day. And I want to say that to me, working in this area of quantum mechanics and Einstein's thinking, perhaps the greatest problem is the fact, or greatest problem as a problem. Problems are things that mean we don't know what's going on. The problem I'll talk about on Monday is we can understand quantum mechanics. And in order to get to a level of understanding, the first thing I want to bring out strongly is that this wave function is not a substance in the ordinary form of any kind of material. In fact, the wave function is pure abstract information, pure theory, and it travels around only because the conditions around it make it have different values. Uh, that's rather subtle, but I hope to explain it. Whereas the particle has material, uh, even a, a light particle like the photon has uh, uh, energy, which is equivalent, mass equivalence. Uh, so it's part takes of matter and energy together, but the wave function is neither. And you know what? That's exactly what I've been arguing all along, that information isn't matter or energy. Instead, it's the arrangement of the matter and the energy. 
And this will give us the tools to look into an attempt to understand quantum mechanics, which I'll spend the rest of my life trying to explain that first to myself and then, and then to you. So Happy New Year. Look forward to having you come back on Monday. And uh, I am about to say thank you very much. Goodbye. Let me put up my email address again. Thank you.